welcome our friend in the service tonight. Thank you for coming tonight. Good to have you. Amen. For the men, don't forget now, Saturday morning will be our men's breakfast in Mount Grove. We would enjoy having you come be there and have some good food and have a devotion. Just enjoy the fellowship together. So that's on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock at Ma and Paul's. I didn't know how good their food was till we started meeting there. It had been a long time. They had some pretty good food. <laughs> Amen. I couldn't tell you a little <laughs> funny story the other day. Maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm forgetting now the reason. We were going, we needed to go to Mountain Grove for something. And I, we were going to go in time to go to breakfast. So we went, pulled into <laughs> malls and malls. And I was bragging on, you know, the breakfast that we had when the men go. So I pulled in there, <laughs> I looked down and realized I didn't have my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so we just had to turn around and go back <laughs> and go back home. Went over <laughs> went over to used to be El Rancho and had breakfast. <laughs> so, so I still haven't taken K up there yet. <laughs> Uh, probably mm, two or three years ago, we decided we'd go down to northern Arkansas. I remember, I think it was in the fall, and we were going down to the cave and drive around. And we got all the way to Gainesville. That's a pretty good drive down there. Turned there off of Highway 5 and, the, and a quick, you know, quick store there and going to get us a snack. Well, we went out there. I forgot my teeth. <laughs> so we just had to turn around, come back, come back home. I wasn't going all day without eating. <laughs> Amen. Well, anyway. <laughs> turn tonight, if you will, to Luke chapter 4. And uh, we're going to look at some lessons in the test of the temptations that Jesus went through. And uh, so we're going to read in Luke chapter 4 and begin at verse number 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up unto a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Jesus answered and said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Lord, thank you now for the word. And we pray that you'll help us to look at these and learn some things from this testing time in the life of Jesus. And Lord, may we also understand that just as Jesus was tempted and tested in ways, we will also be tested in ways to see how we're going to do things and what would be our, 
our reaction and for our own strength and good that sometimes we are going through some times of testing. So, Lord, just help us to learn from this testing time in the life of Jesus, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. I want us to notice to start with, it says, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. This happened right after he had been baptized in water, and when he was baptized in water, remember the Holy Spirit came down from heaven in the form of a dove, rested upon him, and the voice of God the Father speaking from heaven, and Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost. And it says he'd returned from Jordan, was led. But the thing that stood out as I looked over this again, Jesus had just been baptized. He was baptized in water. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost. And then he's led immediately into the wilderness for a testing time. You know, sometimes when the Lord has blessed us in special ways or we've seen great victories, sometimes we're going to be tested of how we handle everything Sometimes when the Lord blesses us with extra revenue, sometimes we're going to be tested what we're going to do with that, how we're going to use that. Sometimes we might be blessed with other ways. I thought about uh, Elijah, you know, had that great miracle day on the, on, you know, before all the false prophets and the fire came down and burned up the sacrifice and everything. I mean, what a great day, a miracle day. And rain, it hadn't rained for a long time. It's going to rain. He was moved by the Holy Spirit so much that he outran the chariot to get back to the city. I mean, there was a great, great victory day. But then we see him right after this because the queen, because she sent word to them, as you did to my prophets, I'm going to do it to you by this time tomorrow. And he took off and he ran and he ran and he ran, hid himself and was afraid of her. Now, you see, it out of all this great, if God could send rain when it hadn't rained all this time, if God could do all these great miracles in one city, could he not take care of one lady? <laughs> but Elijah was so scared that he took off running. Well, he went through a test in time. He had a great day, a great victory day. But he went through a test in time after that, and God had to speak to him and finally get him back on the road again the way he should be. So sometimes we're tested after we've had some big days or big blessings. So, but, but, but the main thing here about the temptation time for Jesus was about the kind of Messiah he would be and how he would use his anointing from God. So number one, he was tempted to use his anointing and position to serve his own interests. That was one of the tests. Number two, he was tempted to attain glory and power over the nations instead of accepting the cross and the way of salvation. Three, he was tempted to be what the popular expectation was for him to be a sensational Messiah. Well, did you know what? Satan still tempts Christians, leaders, in using their anointing, their position, and their ability for their own interest, to establish their own glory and their own kingdom, and to please people rather than God. And some have fallen as a result of that. They get a little bit notoriety and, and so forth, get a kind of a following, get people interested, and all of a sudden, They've elevated themselves. They got puffed up in themselves. They begin to think about themselves and everything's about them and what people can do for them, how much they can gain from men. And first thing you know, it's so much about them that they have lost their anointing, lost the presence of God from their life, and sometimes have fallen away from God because of it. So Satan attempts to try to tempt people to use the things of God for their own use instead of for the glory of God. Now, in this temptation of Jesus, we have displayed three parts or forms that temptations come in. Temptations will fall in the three categories. Be the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, 
And we're going to see that in the, the t- testing time with Jesus. But you know it was also with Adam and Eve. I just want to turn back there and just read this. We're not commenting much on them because that's not what I want to, want to look at. But we see the three examples again displayed when the, when the when serpent came in and, and tempted and, and tried Adam and Eve. It says now the serpent, in chapter 3, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And notice in in verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that, that it was pleasant to the eyes, first of all, it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She disobeyed, took the fruit, and ate it, and gave it to Adam. Now let's go back to Jesus' te- temptation or testing in, in the wilderness in Luke chapter 3. In verses 3 and 4, the devil said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Jesus answered and said, It is written. That's why I wanted to sing that song about the beautiful words. Wonderful words. Notice how Jesus dealt with all of these situations. He used the word. He he quoted the word. He he and he used this against the temptations of the enemy. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. See, what Satan tried to do here, he tried to get Jesus' attention towards the material, physical needs that he had and his desires. Remember, he hadn't eaten anything these 40 days. So he was hungry and says he hungry. You see, the devil would like to come when we are going through a situation. In this case, Jesus would have been hungry physically. And so he comes in a time of hunger or loneliness or times of discouragement, and he tries to take advantage of those to get us to do something wrong, to try to get us to uh, you know, turn this way or that way that wouldn't be right. So he came to Jesus and said, Now, if you be the Son of God... Just command that these stones be made bread. You see, he knew that Jesus was hungry, and so he said, just make these stones, just turn them into bread. And Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, verses three, 5 through 8. We're going to expand on those a little bit more later, but verses 5 through 8. Now, the 3 through 4 was the lust of the flesh. Five through eight is the lust of the eyes. The devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Took him up there, so just a view of the world from that standpoint. You know. So he saw this. This was the lust of the eyes. He saw this. And the devil said to him, All this power will I give you and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will I give it. He said, if you'll just fall down and worship me, all shall be yours. All this shall be yours. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. So there is the lust of the eyes. He showed him all these kingdoms, tried to get Jesus to give in to Satan and worship him, to seek after the ways and things of Satan in order to receive something 
in return from Satan. Satan said, if you'll just fall down and worship me, I'll do this for you. The devil comes along and whispers in people's ears, if you'll just come and follow me, you'll have this and you'll do this and you'll this and this and paints a very pretty picture. Now, he's not going to do that, but he gets a lot of people deceived in thinking that he will really give them something good in return. All he will do is to promise that and get them, get them snared and, and then turn, turn against them. He's not going to do you any good, but he gets a lot of people thinking that. If you'll just follow me, you can have this and this and this. Now, verses 9 through 12 is the pride of life. He brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down from him. For it is written. Now notice the devil used some scriptures here. Now he'll just use the amount that he wants and likes and twists it all up. But, <laughs> but he did use some scriptures. He said, Well, he, you know, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So Satan said, why don't you just jump off this pinnacle and let you know, the Lord just come down and swoop you right up. Jesus answered and said, he said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. That'd be just like some of us going down here at the railroad track and say, well, I believe that God can just protect me from this train so I'll just stand out here on this railroad track well <laughs> the devil said to him just look you know the scripture says if you, you know he gives his angels charge over you and in your hands they'll bear you up lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone so don't just jump off of here Jesus said you shall not tempt the Lord your God it would be tempting God to go out here and stand in the middle of the highway and say the car is not going to hit me because I'm just standing here. That would be ridiculous. That wouldn't prove anything but ignorance. <laughs> Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. If there was a real need for that, that would be different. But it wouldn't be need to just go out there and stand in the middle of the highway or the track just, you know, just to be doing. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. And that's what the devil was trying to get Jesus to do. So he tried to get him to react out of pride. Of who he was. Look who you are, Lord. Look who you are. Well, the Bible says if you just, you know, in your hands he'll bear you up unless you dash your foot. But, come, but see what the devil wanted? He wanted Jesus to jump off there and die and, and, and be the end of Jesus. That's what the devil wanted him. But he made it sound like, you know, let's look who you are. So he, he dealt with the pride situation. And, and he almost implied that the law didn't apply to Jesus. You know, you're too important for anything to happen to you, Lord. So just jump off here. <laughs> so he, he, he dealt, he, he, he tried with the pride of life. Now we're going to look at these in a little more detail. First of all, the lust of the flesh. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now this was written in this context to teach us there is something more important than just pleasing ourselves and our desires and wishes and the things of this life. There's a lot more to things about just and things of this life. Kingdom of God is not meat and drink representing the natural order of things and this life. There's something to life more than that. The kingdom of God is more than that. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So this was a testing time that was commissioned by the Holy Spirit. He was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. And this was for Jesus in this time of fasting if he had turned the stones into bread, he would have placed his physical needs ahead of the spiritual. You see, the spiritual thing needs to take priority over the physical. The spiritual things need to take more over the natural order of things. 
Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus said our life does not consist in the abundance of things that we possess. That's not what the Christian life is about. It's not about things for ourselves. You know, we have need of things, and the, the God has promised us that if we'll seek him and his righteousness first, then he'll help us with the things that we need for our physical and for this life. But if all that we think about is just for ourselves and for this life and for what pampers the flesh, then we miss the point because that's not what life is about for a child of God. And so the less of the flesh applying to things for selfishness, for our own self. And um, there's a verse in, in Deuteronomy 8, 3. I just want to turn back there and just read that. And, and he's talking to Israel, but the principle thing applies today as well. But he's writing to them, and he's talking about their journey and how the Lord was with them and so forth. And in verse 3 it says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and then fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread only but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. So he's writing to them, but he, he still is, is saying that to us. And so Jesus quotes this verse. That's part of the verse that he quoted to the devil in meeting the temptation here from the devil. Jesus was saying that everything important in life depends on God and his will. Depends on God. If we only strive for happiness and success or material things apart from God's way and his purpose, it's going to end up with bitter disappointment and end in failure. And so Jesus stresses this truth when he teaches that we must seek first the kingdom of God. That's God's rule, God's activity, God's will, and his power. Only then will other necessary things be given according to his will and his way. Now, it doesn't say when it says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then I will do this specific thing and name the individual things. He said, all these other things shall be added to you. God knows the other things that we need. And he knows how we can handle things. He knows how much we can handle. He knows. And so he knows what we have need of. And so if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he said, I'll... I'll take care of these other things that you need, and he will do it in his way for our benefit that will help us if we have been seeking him and his kingdom and righteousness first. Now let's look at the lust of the eyes. There's an interesting psalm in Psalm number 73, and we're not going there to read anything about it, but sometimes you might want to look at it. And in this psalm, it says this, he was a, a godly man, but he was looking out at the prosperity of the wicked. It says when he saw, when he looked out and saw the prosperity of the wicked, it almost caused him to go under. It almost caused his steps to slip. He said, when I look out there and I see, I see that old wicked person out there and he's not trying to live right and he's doing evil and doing wrong, and it seems like he just is blessed. He, he gains this, he gets this, he does this, and he doesn't seem to have any problems. That's the way it looked to him. And he says, here I am trying to do right. I'm trying to serve God, and I still have some difficulties sometimes, and I just don't quite understand. And when he looked out there, when he got his eyes on them, and he saw them, what was going on, he almost... Slipped, he said, my feet almost slipped. I almost went under. And it would have, he said, if I hadn't gone into the house of God and I understood and I saw it clearly then about the future of the wicked, you know. And so here I am with the Lord and I have heaven to look forward to. I've got God in heaven. I've got his presence here upon the earth. And I've got something that's going to be good when my life is over here. 
that wicked person won't have anything when his life is over. And said, here I was feeling sorry for myself until I went into the house of God and I saw that. But it was the lust of the eyes. When he got to looking and saw that wicked person and how he was prospering and all the things seemed to be going, his, it almost took him under because he allowed that to affect his relationship. So it was the lust of the eyes and it almost caused him to fall. Well, it caused David to commit adultery because of his, the lust of the eyes. When he saw Bathsheba, and it, it didn't just stop there, it went on to adultery. It went on to, it led on to murder. But all because it started with the lust of the eyes. It's a looking and longing for forbidden things. He saw that fruit. When she saw that fruit, it was pleasant to the eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes. Lust of the eyes. From the standpoint of being tempted to look at something, being promised certain things, like the three Hebrew young men, the king says, if you'll just go back out there and bow down, we'll forget the fact that you didn't bow down to that image to start with. And, and you will not have to be thrown into the furnace if you'll just go out there and bow down again. If you'll go along with the world system, we'll promise you this and we'll promise you that. If you'll just go along with the world. Again, it's the lust of the eyes. The devil would like to get us to look at some of those things. And first thing you know, it causes a desire to go after those things that are wrong. The third one is the pride of life. Again, the devil came into Adam and Eve there in the garden, came to Eve and said, um, just think of who you are. See, it, it, was, it looked like it would make you wise when she saw that. He said, you won't die if you eat that forbidden fruit. Just think of who you are. Just think of who you are. Oh, you know, and so Satan comes along and says, oh, God won't allow the consequences of sin to come on you if you disobey. You're too important. You're too important. And, and, you know, and so he's, he's appealing to the pride of life. And sometimes we have to be on guard against that because we can get so proud of ourselves that we think that we can get by with anything just because of who we are. No, can't do that. And so we don't want to let the devil fool us. Remember when the disciples were told not to preach and teach about Jesus? What did they say? We ought to obey God rather than men. Three Hebrew boys said, you can throw us in the furnace if you want to, but we're not going to bow down to your image. We're not going to bow down. You see, their lives didn't matter to them. The disciples, you know, their lives didn't matter to them. The will of God and the work of God, the word of God, that's what mattered. The value of life was not in themselves, but it was in obedience to God. And so it wasn't about them. Pride of life can keep you from giving yourselves completely to God. If we think we're someone pretty important, we can place limitations and reservations of our life for God to use. We can say, I'll go so much, or I'll give so much, I'll do so much, I'll be involved so much, but that's it, God. And don't ask me to change my routine or my habits. Well, all that, we're thinking about ourselves. We're kind of proud of ourselves. And so we have to realize that it's not about us. It's about him. And sometimes we might hand the blueprints of our life and have it all marked out. Now, God, oh, here, here's the blueprint of my life. Here's the way I want it to be. <laughs> here's the way it is. Uh, here's the way I want it to be. Well, instead of placing here, here's my life, a blank page, God 
your will be done. Your will be done. Not according to my will, not based on my wants and wishes, but Lord, here it is. I want it to be your will. Now this tempting, this testing here, was, was Satan trying, trying to entice Jesus from being obedient to the will of God. In each temptation, Jesus submitted himself to the authority of the word of God. And rather than give in to the desires of Satan, he quoted the scripture. He said, this is the way it is, Satan. This is what the word says. And he didn't give in. He didn't give in. Now, bear in mind, when Jesus came down to this earth, he emptied his power and glory as God and came and lived in the form of man. He learned things from man's standpoint. So he was being tempted. Now, he was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, of course, then led him into the wilderness to be tested. So he went through this testing time. And the devil wanted him to disobey God and, and uh, not go ahead and carry on what he was called to do. So Jesus was learning, just like you and I learn through testing times, because he was, a, in a human form, he was learning the things just as you and I know in the human form. So he was trying, the devil was trying to get him to disobey God. So there's two special things I want us to notice before we finish up. Number one, Satan is our greatest enemy. And as Christians, we must be aware that we're in a spiritual warfare with an unseen but very real power of evil. We never want to forget that. Number two, without the Holy Spirit and the proper use of God's word, the Christians cannot overcome sin and temptation. But we can with the power of the Holy Ghost and the word of God. And if we'll stay full of the Holy Spirit and read the word, be grounded in the word, we can be victorious over the devil. The devil cannot win, doesn't have to win over us, even though that he tries and he tests us and tries to get us to turn away. He can't do it if we stay full of the Holy Ghost and keep the word of God. Read the word. Learn the word. Get the word in your heart, in your life. And then use the word. Stand on the word, just like Jesus did. So here are some things on how to use God's word in overcoming temptation. Now realize, I've kind of already said it, but realize that through the word, you have the power to resist any appeal that Satan can make. You have I want to say that again. Realize through the word, the word of God, you have the power <coughs> to resist any appeal Satan can make. Number two, get the word of God in your soul and mind. Saturate your life with the word. Take time to read the word and study the word. Get your heart and your mind filled with the word. Meditate day and night. <coughs> I don't do this myself, but I was thinking as I was studying on this that it would be good. Now, you know, you, you meditate on what you read. I like to, st to think about what I've been reading. I like to take a little while after I read the Word and my devotions just to think about that, meditate on it, what it's saying and so forth, and just, you know, just think upon it. But I think it would also be good if maybe we'd pick out a scripture every morning and we would write it down or we would... And maybe, maybe memorize it, and we just think about that all day long, you know, different times. Just meditate day and night on scriptures. You know, fill your heart and mind with it. Think about the word and, and so forth. So we want to be saturated with the word. And when you're tempted by the enemy, use the word of God and use those passages. Quote the scriptures to him and even quote the word to God that's given you strength. So stand on the word. That's what Jesus did against the test of the devil. He just quoted the scriptures to him. 
Yes, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Word says. And three times they did that. So so one, also obey the Word of God and keep your life prayed up. Keep prayed up. Keep full of the Holy Ghost. Read the Word of God. And the devil will not be able to tempt you and turn you away. He may try, but he can't do it because your life is built on the Word of God. So it's very important. When I was thinking about that, I thought, you know, we used to do pledges. Remember when we do, you know, we do pledge to the American flag, we do a pledge to the Christian flag, and then we do a pledge to the Bible. So it'd been a long time, so I pulled it up and got the words, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to read that tonight, <laughs> pledge to the Bible. And I wasn't sure how to finish up. Uh, I don't know how many of you have your Bibles with you tonight, and this is not a, this is not a, this, this is not to put you down if you don't have it with you because you you probably read it on the screen so forth. But if you have your Bibles with you, and maybe you can get one of these off of the under the pew under. The, I wonder if we could if we could just stand together and take that word of God and. Uh, and I'm going to read this pledge. And I'll, you, you may know it well enough. You can go ahead and help me. And maybe after we've said it a time or two, you can kind of hold your word up as a signal from you know, about the word. But it says, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. And so the, the Bible is at the center of any Christian devotion to Jesus Christ. And I read this after I looked this up. It says, this simple Bible pledge reflects the importance of God's word and its role in the life of a believer. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. Could we do it once more? I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will, if I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Hallelujah. That's how important it is to read the word, study the word, get grounded in the word. And then when Satan comes along during the testing time, and the devil will do that when we're going through a difficult time, with a physical problem or some other situation, with Jesus, he was hungry because he hadn't eaten for 40 days. And Satan tried to take advantage of it. Someone going through a lonely time or some difficult situation in life, the devil will come along and try to take advantage and try to persuade them, you see what you're going through, God doesn't love you, he doesn't care, won't you turn away from God, won't you forget the whole thing? The devil tries to take advantage of those times. But when you're stating, he'll take the word of God and stand on it. My life's not just about what's going on right now. Life is not just the circumstances I'm seeing right now. Sure, it may be hard right now, but I know it's not going to be this way forever. I know that I can stand on the word. God's going to help me through this time. And Satan, you cannot rob me of this. You cannot turn my heart away from God. I'm grounded on the word, and I'm going to stay with God. So the devil tries to take advantage. He'll try to get us to... Get our eyes on this, our eyes on that. But stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. Stay grounded in the Word. Because then you have the Word then that you can quote back. Now, I don't believe in taking long conversations against the devil. You, you don't want to do that. He'll, he'll try to trap you. 
You just state the word of God and say, this is what the word says, Satan, and that's the end of it. You don't carry on a conversation with the devil. <laughs> you just quote the word and let the word do its work. <laughs> let God take care of the devil <laughs> when you use the word of God. Amen. We're not going to let the devil win, are we? <laughs> We're going to be victorious because God has given us a way to be victorious. Hallelujah. And we can be victorious. Yes, there'll be testing times. But we can be victorious through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Brother Lon, would you dismiss us tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help us to take that into our heart. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God.